So, there's a device here which perfectly translates speech to text. I'm currently sitting in a freezer. It's the safest place here and I don't think I'll be caught. There's a whole load of computers and old laptops, just like in the main lab, but this thing can turn my voice into words. Okay, so, I'm not cold anymore. I should feel this place, the deathly temperature enveloping me, but I can't feel it. I wish I was cold. It was supposed to be a freaking youth retreat. Mom thought it would be the perfect vacation, a trip to Iceland during the holidays. I've never been abroad before, so this was my chance to branch out and actually go somewhere with my life. Mom didn't mean to, but she was unintentionally smothering me. I'm 18 years old, and I was yet to leave the confines of our tiny little town. The brochure and the website they looked promising, describing it as a once-in-a-lifetime getaway to northern Iceland, the more remote parts away from the bustling city of Reknavik and the temperature of tourist spots like the Blue Lagoon. It was a modern, toasty cabin in the middle of nowhere. A youth center specifically built for lost kids trying to find themselves. They really hammered that in with every page. It was impossible not to get lost in the idea of strangers turned soulmates. The brochure's front cover was a photo of the cabin at night lit up in a cozy golden light under the famous Aurora Borealis. There were glossy, full-spread pages of photos of students with their arms around each other, their smiles wide, eyes gleeful and excited. There were luxury hotel rooms and an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet, a heated swimming pool both indoors and outdoors and a chance to see the northern lights in the flash. Seriously, this place looked incredible. I was taking a gap year before heading to college. I had two summers worth of saving, so a trip to Iceland also known as the land of fire and ice, was a step in the right direction of finding myself and my identity after being cooped up with my mom for 18 years. I didn't question any of the red flags in front of me, so in a way, maybe being in this situation is our fault. The plane ride was five hours, a pretty short flight, but I still managed to sleep for the most of it, zonked out on anxiety meds mixed with Red Bull. And the final destination movies had really screwed with my head. The guy sitting next to me with a thing for old school noir gave up on his dog-eared copy of The Maltese Falcon. The cover was already giving me pretentious film student vibes and watched the flight path on the screen in front of us. I was conscious for maybe 20 minutes in total on the flight. The first 10 minutes in the air trying not to throw up from the pressure and pressing my face against the window, staring at the blur of white enveloping us. And then three or four hours in, when the pilots excitedly told us to all look out of the windows, where we could just see the northern lights as the sky was starting to darken. That was when I realized my seatmate had personality, the way that he was shaking me awake with eyes and grinning lips, like we were kids on Christmas morning. Hey. It took him nudging me maybe four times to spring me from slumber, drool pouring down my chin, my cheek uncomfortably pressed to the window. Ugh. Look. He shoved me again and still disoriented and kind of nauseous. I focused on where he was pointing, blinking rapidly. He didn't know my name, so the guy resorted to just repeatedly stabbing me with his index, hoping for the best. The rest of our group were freaking out yelling, some of them crying. You would think that the whole plane was crashing. When my seatmate leaned over me, prodding the window, I followed his finger. The sky was a crystalline blue color that was bridging twilight, but I could still see them. I remembered my stomach turn to Red Bull creeping back up my throat. We were so far up, almost in space and so far from home. So far from the ground. And yet I felt completely and totally at peace. I remember my seatmate shuffled closer to me like he was trying to bond, trying to share an experience. The guy was older than me by a few years, early 20s. Between his mop of unruly brown curls and southern accent, he was cute in an endearing way. He smelled like sandalwood and fall leaves. His flickering breath in my face reeked of the mint candies that he was chewing on. At that moment, we were both real and human and witnessing a sight that was almost painful. The type of pain that would steal the breath from your lungs. 
There they were, an intense, greenish-blue illuminating the almost night. If I had a gun to my head and was forced to pick a favorite moment from this trip, I would say that watching the northern lights with a complete stranger, the two of us bouncing in our seats like two toddlers, was definitely a human moment that I will never forget. Before everything went downhill and our cozy trip to Iceland became something else entirely. I should have noticed that things were shady from the get-go. The flight was just kids and the excursion. I thought it was a usual economy flight until my seatmate pointed out the lack of adults. We were supposed to land in the Akureyri airport. It was the first stop on our carefully put together itinerary on the app. But the pilot insisted that we were taking a detour due to weather patterns. When we finally landed, I noticed that we were in the middle and I mean the middle of nowhere. The unnamed airport was empty. Barring an American guy in his mid to late 20s with a two wide grin, holding a sign with, Hi, I'm Jake, your camp leader. It's nice to meet you. Written in bubbly lettering, kind of juvenile. Camp. I shot my only friend, my seatmate, who was still being stubborn about his name, a panicked look. His optimistic smile didn't waver. A oh, winter camp, maybe. They probably call it something else here. Pulling my hood over my ears, I was shivering. But this place is empty. My unnamed seatmate shrugged, wrapping his arms around himself. Hey, it's got a KFC. He nodded at the familiar logo several feet away. See, we're fine. It's shot. I hissed out, ignoring his raised brow. Looking closer, the store looked almost abandoned. There was a notice on the door, but I couldn't read it. I don't think it was ever open. Well, it is winter. This guy had an answer for everything. Maybe it's shut for the season. It is mid-December. I wasn't convinced, tightening my clammy fingers around the handle of my suitcase. The only thing stopping me from going into panic mode was Kelly Clarkson's under the tree playing over the intercom. Now that I think about it, I think that was my splintering point. There was just us, a silent airport, and a Christmas song crackling over our heads. Yeah, but it's fried chicken. I had to raise my voice over the saxophone solo. I would understand an ice cream store being shut, but I mean KFC? He snorted. Another song started up a popular hit. This time I reveled in its familiarity. My seatmate nudged me to the catchy beat, and I almost stumbled off my feet. You're paranoid. Ah, oh, creepy. The brunette behind us muttered, a slight Scandinavian tinge to her voice. I could barely see the girl, a bright pink scarf wrapped around her neck and the bottom half of her face, light brown hair sticking from a knitted hat. She introduced herself as Aurora, to which my seatmate had responded with a grin. Yeah, like the Borealis. Her parents were obsessed with the country, so the name felt right. I was thankful for Aurora's presence. According to my seatmate, Aurora was like a tour guide up into the detour, occasionally offering her skepticism. She had no idea where we were, and Aurora knew Northern Iceland like the back of her hand, thanks to her mom being born in Selfoss, a town further south. This was her eighth trip to Iceland, apparently, and she had never heard of or seen this place, which was concerning. I was already overwhelmed with the lack of people, the stark emptiness of the airport and the temperature already bleeding into my bones. I could see the night sky through a clear glass roof, inky oblivion with no stars, no moon, no light. Through the automatic doors at the exit was the same, darkness that was impenetrable, like this tiny airport in northern Iceland was completely cut off from the outside world. The others were already questioning our camp leader who was definitely a frat boy in college. Jake reminded me of a surfer dude or the lead love interest in a teen drama. He spoke with his hands, gesturing wildly like, Yo, yo chill, it's all good man, it's chill bro. This guy had definitely been thoroughly trained to keep the peace. Ignoring questions like, Where are we? Why can't I get a signal? He successfully evaded the subject by promising exactly what was on the brochure. Spewing the exact same shtick while leading us out into the dark, straight into snow up to our ankles, 
Jake admittedly did a great job of at least trying to keep up morale when the ice-cold shell had slammed into us. What was advertised on the website and on the itinerary was an Uber straight from the airport. But we weren't in the airport that we thought we were going to. I had no idea where we were. I expected at least some signs of life, traffic on the roads, or maybe convenience stores, but no. The roads were blocked with snow and the sidewalk was black ice. There were no street lights, no traffic lights. I fell twice, almost taking my seatmate with me. In front of us was the dark, nothing but pooling oblivion, a vastness that was almost breathtaking. I wouldn't be able to differentiate the ground from the sky if it weren't for the snow. Aurora, for once, was not helping. She was making me more nervous, repeatedly telling us that it wasn't normal for there to be no streetlights, no sign of civilization in any direction that I turned. My breath caught in wisps of white. And when we boarded a rickety coach, she commented that her vast knowledge of Iceland ended right there. She had no idea where we were or where we were going. When the bus only drove us further into the dark, down winding roads between snowdrifts, I couldn't resist speaking up. Until then, I had been relying on rad wimps, playing on 6% phone battery to loosen the knot in my gut. Where are we going? I demanded, leaning over in my seat. Jake's response was almost a knee-jerk reaction, his head whipping around and smile broadening. Hey, don't worry, we'll be there soon, was all that he said like this guy was a stock record or a confused robot. Now that I was really looking at him in the striking light bathing the bus, I was sure this guy wasn't blinking. His smile was too wide, almost eerily so. Why not look outside? You might be able to see the northern lights. He had repeated this over ten times. I stopped counting when we left the airport. Look outside, look at the northern lights, was all that he said, occasionally commenting about how good the outdoor pool at the campsite was. Oh, so now it was a campsite. I tried to be positive despite my slowly thinning sanity. I tried to think camp was another way of saying you center. I even tried one last look outside, desperate to see anything. Anything that would give me hope we weren't being lured into a place of no return. But there was nothing. When I pressed my forehead against the frosty window, there was no light at the end of a seemingly endless tunnel under a suffocating sky. Only a slowly collapsing pinprick, growing progressively more narrow. The only light was the illumination from the headlights splitting the road in half and even they were starting to flicker out as we delved into nothing. Leaning back in my seat, I clung on for dear life as the bus flew over bumps in the road. Yeah, this is the end of me, I thought, just as the bus slid sideways before righting itself. And Jake, of course, was quick to settle our panic. Hey, this is gonna be fun, I promise. He honked out a laugh when the bus flew over another bump which sent my head smacking into the window. Stars in my eyes, not in the sky. My seatmate asked me if I was okay. His clammy fingers entangled with mine. He was shaking. He still didn't tell me his name. Jake's laugh grew raucous in my spinning head, my mind drifting into fog as the bus continued on, further and further into the void-like tunnel with no ending. <laughs> Wait until you see the pool. I don't know if it's evident from the tone in my voice, I don't know if it comes off across in the writing, but there was no use center retreat. There was no warm cab and no heated pool. Unless you count the hot spring that was just a hole in the ground several feet away from me. It wasn't even a campsite. Jake was the only one with a tent, and his was more of a glamping luxury with a bed. When we asked where ours were, he spotted more crap about it being a fun survival exercise and that we would be taken to the retreat the next morning. If you survive, he waned, before disappearing into his abnormally large tent. So that left us fending for ourselves. Jake wasn't answering questions or was answering questions with cryptic answers. We made a fire which had taken us ten attempts due to the ice-cold wind blowing it out, 
and our slowly diminishing sanity. We did have the natural hot spring and were taking turns dipping our toes in. I think it hit me when frostbite was starting to kick in, and I had stopped dragging myself to and from the hot spring to plunge my hands into our only source of heat. I was starting to lose track of time trying to submerge more of myself into the water as the night went on, and the temperature dropped. Aurora told me that I was making it worse, so I slumped down on the rock-hard ground, pulled my legs to my chest to conserve body heat, and allowed my dizzy thoughts to drift. It had sounded like the perfect vacation. Yeah, that's what I thought. Drinking in each face in front of me. Our small huddle of shadows around a slowly dying fire. Sitting in minus temperatures directly under the northern light sounds good on paper. Or watching a TikTok wrapped up in bed. Those videos have all been perfectly edited to catch your eye. The Blue Lagoon, famous volcanoes and hot springs, the culture and the food. But actually being in the raw unedited footage that they don't show. Sitting on frozen ground in front of blurred oranges, your brain isn't sure as fire or the sun. Any heat being whipped away by the ice cold wind chill, slowly freezing. And I mean all of you. Your bones and blood feel numb, your skin doesn't feel like yours, and your thoughts are scattered between memories of home and hope that help might come. And also chocolate fudge sundaes. I was wrapped up in three coats. Aurora's lips were turning blue. The sky was oblivion above me, no stars, and no northern lights. Conversations varied from fear that we weren't going to make it, absolution that this was the end, and then threats to destroy Jake. We planned it all out. When we were still coherent, Penn had devised a plan to steal the guy's phone. We had all agreed and repeatedly said yes, we're going to do this. But I'm not sure how to describe the onset of hypothermia, confusion. Penn said three times that he was going to steal Jake's phone, but he was still sitting across from me frowning at the fire. His head was cocked and when I really concentrated, I could see icicles slowly spreading across his brow. I wasn't sure if I was seeing things, but after days of these staring at my seatmate for a while, I realized that I had imagined that he had a name. Pan. He still wasn't giving me his real one despite his hands and mine. I had a moment of clarity which was quickly suffocated by a chill that almost knocked me backwards. Wait. No, did he tell me his name? No, he definitely didn't. So, why was his name on my tongue? Pen. His jacket was over my shoulders while Aurora's was hanging off of his. I had Nick's gloves and Nick was borrowing my sweatshirt. Ethan had one of my socks and Sonny was wearing my jeans. Does anybody have any spooky stories? Pen broke the silence which was starting to sound like the end itself. So quiet and yet peaceful. His teeth were chattering and rubbing his hands together. Ten minutes earlier, he had tried to stuff his hands into the fire. Nick stopped him. Just, I still didn't know his name. Penn's smile was the shell of his former self. No longer a wide grin bursting with optimism. It was more of a grimace, not even trying. I could see icicles forming under his nose too. That was kind of worrying. Did hypothermia include turning into ice? I thought, angling my head to see him better. No, I was probably hallucinating. Pressing my head into my lap, I exhaled breath into my hands. It was freezing cold, almost enough to snap me out of it. I was so cold and nothing was going to get better. I had had half a mind to slice open my hand to feel the warmth of my own red, but I couldn't bring myself to move. Moving was tiring and I just wanted to go to sleep. I've got one. Nick mumbled into his knees. I thought that he was asleep. My body was very slowly tipping into Ethan. Once upon a time, a group of people sued their psycho camp leader for abandoning them in the cold. Penn nodded slowly, his arms wrapped around his legs, chin resting on his knees. That was beautiful and truly poignant, Nick. I noticed Penn's voice was slurring a little. In the flicker of orange flame, I noticed that his breath wasn't reacting with the cold air anymore. Strange. I remember rocking back and slamming back first onto the ground. 
I didn't move, closing my eyes until Aurora dragged me back to a sitting position. Stay awake, she told me. I tried, but it was hard, especially when I stopped feeling cold and suddenly, I was all warm and toasty, ready to sleep. I was curling into a ball and burying my head between my arms, when Penn once again stopped us from falling. Anyone else? I cracked one eye open. Aurora's eyes were flickering. Ethan's were closed, but he shook his head. Sonny wasn't moving. The blur of blonde curls and woolly hat that was the girl was curled up on her jacket. It looked like her body had already started to harden. I'm just resting my eyes, was all that she had said. But nobody commented that her lips were blue when she said that. When Sunny stopped responding, none of us really announced that she was gone. I had half a thought to maybe cover her up with something out of respect. But then I started thinking about the hot fudge sundaes instead. Sure, I've got a story. The voice snapped me to fruition, like a nuclear bomb had gone up behind me. Lifting my head from where it had been uncomfortably lodged in my arms, I blinked. Now I definitely wasn't seeing things. There was a shadow looming over us, two others in the corner of my eye, which didn't make any sense. We were completely alone, stuck in the middle of nowhere. So how could they be here? Sure, I would entertain the hallucination. The kid was our age, blondish brown curls and clad in a frozen letterman jacket hanging off of him. His face was too pale like he was one with the snowflakes swirling around us. I focused on his friends, a guy with a shaved head, and a tiny redhead in a blue and gold cheer skirt. Her clothes confused me. Who in their right mind would be wearing a cheer uniform? All three of them were barefoot. The main guy slumped onto the ground and held out his hands in front of the fire almost mockingly. I stared really hard at him before I remembered that our fire had blew out a while ago. And Penn looked like he might speak, questioning why these three barefoot kids were in the middle of nowhere. But I don't think that he could. Nick had slowly lifted his head, but I don't think he was fully conscious, only regarding them with a frown. Eyes a flickering, and lips parted. The guy cleared his throat. Alright, are you guys ready to hear a spooky tale? He laughed when the redhead had shoved him with a smile. They weren't cold. That's all I remember thinking. Neither of them were wearing coats or shoes and no thermal clothing to shield them from the cutting chill slicing into the air. There was once a group of campers who were abandoned by their head counselor. He caught himself mocking a frown. Wait a minute, no, that's you. Ah, oh, sorry, let me start again. Sure, Penn was smiling, his head bowing. I kicked him to keep him awake. Alive. Okay, so once there was a college football team. His smile faded and I noticed how dark his eyes were, two hollowed out holes in his head. The crest of his letterman jacket looked old. They were good, like really good, good enough to make it to the championships. This guy had a good storytelling voice, keeping us all awake with over-exaggerated voices and actions. But, unknown to them, their fates were sealed aboard their doomed flight. He cleared his throat. And what did their school do? What did their town do? Nothing. His lips split it into a grin. They didn't want the team to win. They wanted them to lose. So they covered it up. Sonny was speaking. Wait, no. Sonny was gone. That was my voice. The guy nodded grimly. Bingo. Do you want to guess where their doomed flight had landed? He didn't wait for a response. Yep, you got it. Iceland in the middle of nowhere. The guy screwed up his face. I'm talking about the parts of Iceland that haven't even been discovered yet. They did find the help eventually and promise of shelter. A youth retreat with a steaming pool both inside and outside. I was slowly taking in his words. They were kind of familiar. The boy leaned back, running his hand through his hair. First, he paused for a fact. They had to survive the bitter chill of night and come morning. They would be taken to safety. The boy held his finger to his lap. But they came to realize that being left out to freeze was just the beginning of the adaption. He jumped up, circling around our group. 
One by one, they started to succumb to the cold. But this wasn't the usual cold man. This was the type of cold that becomes a part of you. He stepped in front of Pan, reached out, and poked the boy in the face. The leader was first, he mocked. Oh, he was so tired, tired of having hope, tired of trying to keep himself alive. I started to wonder if this guy was more than a hallucination. When he moved, the snow seemed to dance with him. Others followed, he continued, all of them dropping one by one, breath by breath, until only one was left standing. He crouched beside Sonny, traced his fingers across your cheek. But they didn't pass. The guy's tone hardened. I noticed that his friends looked uncomfortable. They weren't allowed to, he spat, straightening up. Soon, they were out of the cold, escaping it by a surgeon's hand. The redhead had jumped to her feet, motioning for them to go, but he continued. Now prisoners and reluctant test subjects of a mad scientist, trying to turn fantasy into reality. They were no longer human, their thoughts filled with cravings that they didn't understand. I nodded slowly. And did it work? I asked through numb lips. Did the mad scientist succeed? He caught my eye. Sort of, he said. First, they shined bright, truly. They were the epitome of what he was trying to make. However, humans aren't cut out for that kind of change to their anatomy. The mad scientist watched in horror as each of his shining stars had failed, passing on the surgical table. He disposed of them and continued his experiments on unsuspecting students. His lips split into a grin, sharpened incisors resembling fangs. I remember wondering how he was doing that thing with his face, like that was impressive. Even for hypothermia-induced hallucinations, there was something coming alive in his face, inky darkness spiderwebbing under his eyes, going into his iris. But, he caught my eye with a grin and then pens, we were the only ones still awake. His first subjects were the start of it because they, he tipped his head back and blew a raspberry. Nick dropped to the ground at that moment, his body slamming into it with a meaty smack. The guy barely noticed. Well, I guess they were the start of something, even if that led to failure. Huh, good story. I wanted to clap, but my hands weren't moving, none of me was moving. The guy marked a bow when his friends dragged him back, elongated fangs folding back into his mouth. The end. I think I passed out once the words left his mouth. No, I was still awake. I could hear the crunch of his toes in the snow. I felt my body hit the icy ground this time. I didn't feel the need to get up or open my eyes, but when the crunch of his footsteps collapsed into white noise in my head, I forced my eyes open. The standout gold in his jacket was startling against the backdrop of snow. There were smears of red where there shouldn't have been. Tears and stains that I didn't notice. Or maybe I didn't want to notice them. The more I looked at his fading shadow, I wondered if he was real. And when my gaze lazily found the back of his head, that crater-sized cavern carved into the back, I knew. Sorry. I'm okay. I'm sorry. It was a long time before he spoke again. By then, my ankles were being violently tugged and I was flying. No, I was in somebody's arms, clinging to the heat that their body was giving off. My head was dangling at an odd angle. I remember they dropped me and I hit something hard and I was seeing shapes. Still no stars or northern lights. For what? This time, the red-headed girl was standing over me, her eyes were sad. When the smooth metal of something was pressed into the flesh of my temple, my body jerking to the side, I asked again. For what? but I couldn't move my lips. The passage of time seemed to speed up. One minute I was lying in the snow, a baggage of figures hanging over me. Ghost football players in the backs of my eyes and the next, I was lying directly under blinding light. I wasn't cold anymore. The shadow collapsing onto a figure moved in snapshots of consciousness as I moved in and out. I counted consciousness and the light fixtures every time they flickered. I knew that I was awake. Blank. My brain was burning, my body was alight, and I was shaking. 
jerking side to side violently. A gloved hand held me in place. I was screaming, a deep, raw cry coming from my throat. I could feel the tip of a blade. Lemonade was forced through my lips, and then hot cocoa, and then Coca-Cola, Pepsi, hot fudge sundae. When they were blinking on and off erratic while my body was forced into my side and then my stomach and back, I was guzzling soda that tasted a little bit too thick. And then something in my neck, something into my vein. Whoever this person was, they took their time, as if reveling in it. When the lights flickered for the last time, I caught it perfectly. A single flash in my vision, light that had shadows to it. Light that was made of dust and light that she colored. I was sitting up, primed on my toes, something warm and slithery squelching between my fingers. There was frost on my fingers, tiny shards of ice pushing through my skin and spreading at the back of my throat. Another prick and I was falling. I woke up coherent, my wrist strapped down, this time dazedly watching a gurney squealing past me. The blankets covering the body were stained an odd shade that I had never seen before. Red had never looked so good, like I could reach out and drain it from the blanket, sucking away every stain. I didn't realize that I was fighting my restraints, trying to claw for the blanket when a mangled arm slipped from the table. The beaded bracelet that he was wearing. That stupid thing jingling like crazy when he was trying to wake me up to watch the northern lights. I still did not know his name. I watched suited figures and figures in white haul the boy into their arms and throw into an incinerator. Aurora followed. I could see locks of her hair and then Sunny and Nick. I watched all them be shoved into the fire. I don't think I cried. Maybe I did, but I think I forgot how to. A week after I saw them burn, I was let go to get comfortable with my surroundings. I tried to destroy my creator, but he can't seem to be affected. But he does give me food. Yesterday I found Pen. Inside a giant glass box, the guy's eyes were a strange color. Almost a tendril-like darkness spiderwebbing under his eyes. When he saw me, he opened his mouth and smiled. And then went after a bunny rabbit hopping around his cage. I told him with my eyes that I would get us out of here. But looking outside, there is only sky and snow. The sky is two colors, pitch black and crystalline blue. There are no northern lights. The location is hidden when I check. There's just a large patch of white. Can somebody tell me where we are? And if you find us, can you help us get out? I promise I'm not a monster. I just want to go home.